We're getting back here to Matthew chapter 5. We ask the question, will you seek revenge and hatred or love and forgiveness? Because it says, ye have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. See, the natural instinct is revenge and hatred. But God's calling us to a path of love and forgiveness, to turn the other cheek. That's what God wants from his disciples. Verse 43, ye have heard that it hath been said, thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Love your enemies. Someone that's wronged your family, hurt you, God says, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Who wants to do that? Nobody. No one. I don't want to do that. No one wants to do that. That's not natural. That's unnatural. The natural instinct is go get them. But God's saying the opposite is what we need to do. We need to follow a path of love and forgiveness, not revenge and hatred. All the things mentioned in these verses, verses 43 through 45, are things God does for us daily. Christ taught us to love our enemies. Here's what Romans 8, 7 says, because the carnal mind is enmity against God. That word enmity means the quality of being an enemy. Our natural mind is the enemy of God. Just what we are by nature, we're God's enemy. We're against him. We're not for him. No man seeketh after God. All we like sheep have gone astray. He came after us. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. We didn't seek him. We love him because he first loved us. He came after us. He taught us to love our enemies. This is what he does on a daily basis. He continually loves us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He loved the world, is what that verse says. It's not some. It's the world. And he died for them. He said, love your enemies. That's exactly what he did. We're his enemies. Romans 5.10, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Now look at Romans 5.8, or I, I know not look at it, I have it printed up here. So, but Romans 5.8 says, but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So when we were enemies, God reconciled us to him by his death. And he says he commendeth his love toward us. Even in that while we were yet sinners, he died for us. Even though we're sinners, he died for us. He commendeth his love. He showed us his love. He demonstrated his love for us. And this is what he tells us to do. Love your enemies. That's what he says to do. Christ taught us to bless and to do good. The next part says, Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. Them that hate you. I mean, hatred, somebody that wants to kill you, God says, do good to them. Isn't that what he did? I mean, he's there dying on the cross, and the, the two thieves are next to him, cursing him. And he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The Roman soldiers that are there, the, the, the religious uh, uh, Pharisees and the, the scribes that are there, mocking him, mocking the one that created him, that created them. He says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He's asking a blessing on them, forgive them. In the midst of the suffering he's going through. I'm not talking about he went through this, this thing of suffering and then he, he got through it and five years later he was finally able to say, oh, God bless them now. No. He's going through the midst of it. That it's so bad he cries out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's how bad it was. He, at that moment he's bearing the weight of all of our sin on him. Their sin. And he still says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. In the midst of it. This is what God's calling us to. This is not easy. Not easy. We cannot do this apart from God. Cannot. 
I can't. How do you forgive someone that does something horrible to you? I think of my, my friends, Alan and Veronica Garcia, who lost their daughter. You know, they're in just a horrible spot. Pray for them. Bitterness is engulfing them. Pray for them. How do you forgive someone like that that takes your child's life? I don't know. I don't know. Apart from God, I don't know how you would do it. But this is what God calls us to. Put yourself there. What would you do if it was you? Because that's what God calls us to. Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Pray for your persecutors. Isn't that what Jesus did on the cross? He prayed for them. He prayed for them. I encourage you to read this, the book, that book, I've mentioned it before, by Richard Wormbrandt, Tortured for Christ. It's, you could probably get it for free if you go to Voice of the Martyrs. Uh, again, he was in prisons for his faith for 14 years, some in Nazi Germany and I don't know if it was Germany, but where he was at, they, the, the Nazis took over, so he was imprisoned. And then also in Romania, after it all got cut up, the, the communists got it where he was at in Romania, and he ended up in prison as well there. And, I mean, it talks about just some of the torture. He describes the torture that they went through and what they faced and what others faced, and then praying for their persecutors. That's a grace only God can give. But this is what God calls us to. This is what God expects of us. Let's go, if we would, to Acts. I want to say it's chapter 6 real quick. Now it's going to be Acts chapter 7. Okay, let's go to um, let's go to verse fifty four, Acts seven fifty four. This is Stephen. He's preaching his message here. He's the first martyr after Christ. Verse fifty four. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. They gnashed on him with their teeth. So the preaching of the word cuts them to the heart. And this is how mad they got. They gnashed on him with their teeth. They got so mad, they ran after him and bit him. And that's how mad they were. I mean, that's what, like, toddlers do. And this is how mad they got. I mean, you know, who's been bit by a toddler, man? Those sharp little teeth, man. Those things are like razors. Ah! I mean, you'll jump when they get you, you know? But I'm telling you, because they get mad, they're just like, ah! I mean, and they go after you. And this is how mad they were that they went after Stephen because of what he was preaching. And he was preaching Christ to them and, and that it was their sin. But so they ran on him and gnashed on him with their teeth. But he being full of the Holy Ghost, amen, that's important right there, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord. So they're, they're so mad. I mean, I, I imagine, I, I don't know, I'm not, I wasn't there, but I imagine as I read this that someone's probably biting him. There's people all over him. And he says, behold, I see the heavens open as they're biting on him, as they're coming after him and attacking him. And as he's, he's saying that, they cry out with a loud voice. I imagine they just went, ah, and they stopped their ears. They plugged their ears so they wouldn't have to hear what he said because they didn't want to hear it anymore because they were cut to the heart. And cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul, later to be the Apostle Paul. And I dare say that his conversion came about because of this failed preaching, as many would see it. That was, you know, you wasted your breath. That was a failure. Nobody got saved. But later you read in Acts chapter 9, when Paul, Saul, meets the Lord on the road to Damascus, Jesus says something to him. He says, it's hard for thee to kick against the pricks, isn't it? That conviction. 
Like you'd go to an animal, you'd poke it, and the animals would kick back. Ah, oh, I don't want that. So they'd go to them, keep going, keep going. they poking them. It's hard for you to kick against those pricks, isn't it? Because he's getting pricked in his heart, and he's fighting it, and he's fighting it. God knows that. And I think I would take it back to this right here. And they laid their feet, their, their clothes at a young man's feet named Saul. It wasn't a failure. See, he, he died and didn't maybe get to see the results. How God used him. Oh, but God used him in a mighty way. We have half our, half our New Testament because of, I say, Stephen's message. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice. Get this right here. Lord, lay not this into their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. God took him. Lord, lay not this into their charge. They're killing him. They're stoning him. I want us to just stop and think about what that means to be stoned to death. That would be a horrible way to die. Horrible. I mean, I've, in my mind, I, just, I try to picture things and as how it would be. And I can't imagine what it would be like as they drag you out. They've already bit you. And now they're dragging you outside of the city and they throw you outside of the city. I, I, I don't know where. Maybe I'd, I'd guess against a wall. And they're just enraged, lined up around you, and you can just see that fierce hatred and anger in their eyes as they start picking up stones. And they just start throwing them at you as hard as they can, like you would a tennis ball or something. Anybody ever played wall ball as a kid? You better get to that wall quick, right? Remember, if you, got the, if you touched the ball, but you didn't catch it, you had to get to the wall, touch the wall before they got the ball there? Or what happened if you didn't get there in time? If the ball beat you there, then you'd have to stand on the wall like this, right? And everyone would line up. That's how we played anyway. Everyone would line up behind you and they'd all get a free shot at you as hard as they wanted. That's how we played it. I don't know. I know there's some different versions, but that's how we'd play. And man, when I got to throw it at somebody, I mean, it was, man, lights out as hard as I could. And usually I hadn't, you know, threw it as hard as I could. I never hit them. Most everyone never hit them because they were all trying to hit them as hard as they could, you know, but you'd be there and sometimes, man, that ball would come and it would hit like right here. And you're just standing there just like waiting. And it's, ah, man, that thing hits and you jump. I mean, it'd scare you. And sometimes you'd get hit. Ah, you know, that stings you. Now imagine someone doing that with a rock, a boulder. People after people surrounding you. you. You aren't going anywhere. What you're thinking. The fear that's in you. Think he wasn't afraid? I guarantee he was. The fear. As you're looking, just like, there's nowhere to go. And you just, Lord, what do I do, God? That first rock hits you. The next one, another one hits you in the head. Blood starts running down your face. And you drop to the floor. Another one, just rock after rock, just hitting you and hitting you and hitting you. It meant to be stoned to death. Imagine if there weren't enough people and they got tired and you're there bleeding to death and they stop to catch their breath. Send a young boy, go collect those rocks for us. Bloody rocks, he brings them back to you. Pick them up again. Start throwing them at them. I don't know how it went. That's what he went through. But the testimony of the Lord, because he loved the Lord. And in the midst of that, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. You know, we used to call a credit card a charge card. You know, you put it on their account. You, you know, you charge something, you put it on my account. I got to pay it. That's my debt. And Lord, Lay not this into their charge. Don't put it on their account. That's Christ's likeness right there. That's Matthew 5, what was it, verse 48. 
Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. That's what he's talking about. Like Stephen. Be ye therefore perfect. Lord, lay not this into their charge. See, but Stephen was full of the Holy Ghost. We need to be full of the Holy Ghost. We can't be full of the Holy Ghost if we're not full of God's Word, if we're full of the world and not full of His Word. We've got to disconnect. We've got to unplug. And it's hard. I know. It's hard. We're busy. I get it. I know. I've, I've, there hath no temptation taken you but such as is common to man. If you felt it, everybody in this room's felt it. If you've had a struggle reading your Bible, everybody in this room has had that same struggle. If you've had a struggle spending time in prayer, everybody in this room has had a struggle spending time in prayer because there hath no temptation taken you but such as is common to man. If you felt it, then you can count on it. Everybody else in here has. That includes me. But if we want to live like that, as the Bible talks about there in Matthew chapter 5, Pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. Be therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. If we want to live like that, if we want to be a disciple, we have to be full of the Holy Ghost. We have to dedicate ourselves to His Word. It's got to fill us and feed us. It's got to go through us so it can cleanse us and change us and, and renew our mind, renew our thinking, change the way we think. Get the old man out and be filled with the new man. We have to do that. And it's, it's a daily challenge, I know. And hey, if you fail today, then get at it tomorrow. And the next day. And the next day. And ask forgiveness. Ask God to forgive you. I mean, but just get at it. He says this in verses 46 and 47. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Is what's the big deal about that if you love those that love you? Like, okay, so we'd say, well, I love my family. I, I'm going to take care of my family. Said, okay, that's great, but what reward have ye? He says, do not even the publicans the same? The publicans in, in Jesus' day were known as wicked thieves. I mean, that, that was uh, an insult to be called a publican if someone called you a publican. They were thieves. They were tax collectors, and they ripped people off. Worse than that, they were Jews who worked for the Roman government. It's bad enough working for the government, right? I worked for them for... I think eight years. That's bad enough. Actually, it was a good job. But you know what I mean? You think, oh, government worker, you know. Man, when I was working for the city, there was some layoffs there. Um, one time, you know, they laid a bunch of guys off because they found these shovels that could stand up by themselves. All right, that was a joke. It was a bad one, I guess. All right, okay. You know, that's how they think of government workers. You're like, oh, a government worker, you know, and I, some of it's true, all right? I, I, I witnessed it, but okay, they were Jews working for Gentiles, the Roman government. I mean, that was just a no-no to the Jews. We saw how they treated the Samaritans a few weeks back when we looked at that, the story of the Good Samaritan. So it was uh, bad for a Jew to work for the Roman government, and that's what these publicans did. They were tax collectors, and they were thieves on top of that. Rome didn't care. They said, we want our cut. You make sure we get our money. And because the people had to pay the taxes, the publicans would say, well, it's, it's, actually, they, it's supposed to be 20 bucks, you're going to have to pay 30. And they'd keep the rest for themselves. I don't, I'm just giving you an example. They were thieves like that. So it was horrible to be called a publican. But he said, look, hey, if you love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? Don't these wicked publicans do the same thing? They love their family just like you love yours. So what good is that? Love your enemies is what he's saying. Love those that persecute you. Love those that hate you. That's what he's saying to do. And if ye salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans so? And this fits right in line with the story of the Good Samaritan. Hey, if you're just going to salute your brethren, what do you do more than others? Everyone does that. Everyone will say hi to their friends. Everyone will be helpful to their friends. He's saying be helpful to a stranger. Go beyond. See, we can choose revenge and hatred which is the first part of the last week, what I preached last week, but the first part of this starting there in verse 38, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. You can seek that revenge, but Christ is calling us to something higher. He's saying, no, no, that's not what I want for you. 
Resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Don't seek revenge personally, is what he's saying. Seek instead love and forgiveness. That's what a disciple of Christ is called to. To forgive. To love. Ephesians 4.32, let's go there and we'll be done. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. It's a verse we had our children quote quite often. I don't know, hopefully they still know it. I don't know if they do. But it's a good one for adults too. And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. And here's why we can forgive one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. If he can forgive us, we can forgive others. For every wicked, awful thing we've done, he can forgive us. We can certainly forgive others. So hatred and revenge or love and forgiveness. When someone wrongs us. Look, when someone in this congregation wrongs you and does something wrong, you can get your feelings hurt. You can get mad about it. You can not say anything and you can stop coming. You can leave and get away from God. You can do all that. Or you can go talk to them. You can forgive them. And recognize that just like you make mistakes, other people here are going to make mistakes. I'm telling you, that day's coming if it, if it hasn't already. Just be willing to forgive. They messed up. Maybe they said something they shouldn't have. So have you before. So have each of us. Be willing to forgive them. Be willing to forgive. Why? Because Christ forgave you. He can forgive us. We can forgive others. 